Mike. Hey, man. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you not oh, hear cool. me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you too. How are you doing, man? How's uh, how's everything your side? And thank you I'm very great. much for coming Welcome on. Welcome to my uh, my little cottage in in Turkey. We're renting a spot in Kash in the south, and so I've been here for like two weeks after a pretty crazy three month whirlwind in in East Africa. So uh, just relaxing and getting some some deeper work done. Sometimes it's hard to, you know, get on top of emails and and get some some big projects worked done when you're on a new adventure every single day but uh so just relaxing a little bit i guess that 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 bit about not being traveling constantly for the last 10 years has that been a little bit of a blessing in some way or like a silver lining for you that that you've had a little bit of time I, i'm guessing from what i understand like because you were in back home in canada i think has yeah. that allowed you know just a bit of downtime deep breath relax yeah, I, I think uh, that's what I told myself, at least, <laughs> because I, I've been traveling. Yeah, like my life is travel. I don't really have a home. So I have a, a hometown, which is in uh, New Brunswick, Canada, on the East Coast. But I've been doing this 11 months out of the year for a couple of years now uh, because I've got the YouTube channel. I've got a TV show. I've got a podcast. All these things kind of travel with me. And so it's been my life. And when everything had to stop, I i mean, I didn't have anywhere to go. So I went back to my hometown. I was actually in, in the middle of Yemen uh, <laughs> when I got a knock on my tent saying I had to leave to go home because the world was falling to pieces. I didn't even have a, a connection then. There was a, a scratch on my tent at 2 a.m. Uh, I was staying with my girlfriend on the island of Socotra, and um, the flight I was supposed to be taking to leave uh, was like, I don't know, 10 days away or something. And then they scratched on the tent at 2 a.m. and said, hey, by the way, that flight is now canceled, and it's now rescheduled for four hours from now. So, <laughs> And if you're not on it, you're going to have to stay here <laughs> indefinitely. So I... Uh, I headed out and uh, was home for about three months until until July. So March until the ju July, that's around three months. And then after that, I've been traveling since July uh, 2020. So now it's, uh, what is it, March, 20, April now, 2020, 2021. So it's been still a, a, almost a year on the road um, during a pandemic. Okay, wow. So I, I actually thought you were you were stuck in, in Canada for longer than that. So you've actually been back on the road since July. Um, yeah. which is yeah a good effort considering half of the world has still been and still is pretty much shut down, isn't it? In 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 major parts, um, is is Turkey? Is it a place that you've chosen now just because of its kind of like it's got less regulations and they're less stricter on on like restrictions of moving in and out? Is it, or is that just you found yourself in Turkey because of your next trips and and things like that? Uh, that's I, I went to Tanzania in January 2021 for that reason because they they the government and the health ministry minister both denied the existence of covid-19 in the country yeah <laughs> uh which is i mean of course it did exist uh, but however there was no lockdowns there there was there was nothing like that at all so uh, i wanted to climb kilimanjaro there was an offer to do that there was some really cool experiences there with some of the local tribes like the hadzabe hunter gatherers and the maasai and I, I i'd never really i'd been there before uh on a very kind of tourist itinerary like did the safari and everything but wanted to go back and really immerse myself so i was in east africa for three months and actually i'm planning to go back again in a month because there's a lot of really cool stuff over there. Uh, Turkey only because originally we thought it would be more open. Uh, we're here now. They've now, ugh, uh, we discovered that upon arrival that there was a complete full um, curfew on Sundays, every day after seven and on Sundays. And then starting tom tomorrow, um, it's Saturday and Sundays. So, and it doesn't apply to tourists, but if everything's closed, what are you gonna do? I mean, the locals, ha local people, have to stay home. Um, but as a tourist, like, there's you can't go to the restaurant, you can't go to the bar, you can't. Everything's closed, so uh, you can go for a hike, which is nice. But it's, um, yeah, it's still nice here. Turkey's a beautiful spot, man. I, I, it's one of those places that whenever I come here, I, I really like it. The food, the culture, the people. It, it's, it's a great, it's a great place. Yeah, um, a place that's on my list. I've never actually been to Turkey, but it's definitely high up on my list. Um, but back to your Tanzania and kind of East African adventures, obviously very close to my heart because I've you know born and brought up in Kenya. Yeah. And my family's still out, out in Kenya and then lived a bit of time in Tanzania as well, but like Dar es Salaam 
Um, so I used to drive through a lot of the country just like from school in Kenya to get back to to, to home in Tanzania. And I, I took amazing interest in your, in your last, uh, I don't know if it's your latest video, but one of your latest videos of your time with, was it the Hazare tribe that I've obviously, I had never heard of? Is it Hazare? Mm. Uh, Hadza or Hadzabe. And I didn't even know, because obviously most, you know, the major kind of one encompassing language in most of East Africa is Swahili. And then there's, you know, in Kenya, there's probably like 40 to 45 tribal languages, the same again in Tanzania. But I hadn't realized that that clicking language was as far north. Like I'd always associated it with kind of like, you know, Southern Africa, Okavango Delta and, um, and those kind of areas. And to hear that in Tanzania was amazing. And then just the experience that you had there, like you, it sounds as though you were embedded in like living with the, with the community for, for what, for a couple of months was it, how long was it? No, it was only, it was only a couple of days, but um, it, it was really interesting to, oh, one skill that I've developed over the years that I really pride myself on. And I say skill because you have to I just do it through, practice really is being able to like become friends with people who don't speak your language or share zero cultural similarities so <clears throat> by doing this job and as a travel content creator and, and youtube uh, well and tv host and stuff you have to learn to just assimilate yourself into these situations with people it doesn't matter if they're in florida or <sighs> tanzania to to immerse yourself and become friends with people. And honestly, I, I was such an introvert my entire life. I had zero social skills growing up. But the, the cool thing about travel is, I mean, maybe you, you first learn the skill when you're in a hostel in Bangkok and you're all there by yourself because you're traveling solo or your friend left and you have to like be social with people who don't really speak your language or whatever it is. And it's funny, after a couple years of travel, uh, then going back to like my hometown, for example, years ago, um, and then having to make myself fit in with people who don't speak my language uh, and then trying to make myself fit in at a party or something was so much easier. It's like <laughs> before I remember in high school and early university, I just felt like I didn't know how to be social, but then coming back after traveling for a few years and you're like, Oh my God, everyone here speaks my language. So like, it's already so much easier now. <laughs> and so with, with the Hadzabe and all these tribes, I, I pride myself on the ability to be able to get comfortable and break down that tourist local barrier much faster than most people honestly it's because i'm not afraid of getting diarrhea i'm not afraid of rolling around in the dirt i'm not afraid of getting some thorns stuck in my leg or whatever it be so um i just jump in and try to do exactly what they're doing with uh, with no regrets and, and no remorse and so i was able to get a quite a deep relationship with those guys in just uh, just a couple days and we got made an amazing video there as you saw yeah and yeah, the video was was amazing. I mean, I'm mainly talking about that experience of um, the actual, like the actual hunt that you went on. Um, it, it looked to me, like why I said we were there for ages, because it looked to me you were kind of like camped out with them, mm. and and then obviously that experience that you had, you went to get the, they kind of, it seemed like they were en route on on a hunt. I think it was like for baboons or something, and then. Uh, they just like saw some wild honey, I think, and decided to take it like an <laughs> off route because it was an opportunity. And then yeah. you managed to rig up like a GoPro with with one of the guys, and and it just it, it was so like live and immersive that it was yeah. I thought you captured it amazing. Yeah, um, yeah, those they were so cool to work with. Uh, and you're right, the click language. I didn't know they spoke that way uh, until I got there, which was a, a very interesting surprise. Uh, hearing the, the click language, they called it Hazane, and apparently there's no other language like it. Like it doesn't have any roots other places. Who knows? I mean, language and culture travel quite fluidly even if we can't document it but like those guys i mean we're used to eating the same five animals you know maybe salmon chicken beef pork whatever they eat anything the first thing we found was a bat they shot it with a an arrow that had a corn cob on it <laughs> so so yeah. it wouldn't like pierce the skin so much then they found like a kudu like a baby deer uh Mir uh, mongoose and then we ended up getting yeah the the killer bees honey like these guys went up into a tree smoked it out with some some uh, grass and then they were just grabbing honeycomb out of out of the uh, the tree and the thing is like again i'm trying to be one of the boys as much as i can try to be and so one of them hands me some honeycomb after he comes back down and i take a bite and i realize that they're not 
just eating the honey. They're eating like the larvae, larvae. The, bees, the eggs. Yeah. And so I yeah. take a big bite of what I thought was, I knew there was some bees in there that, that weren't uh, quite mature with the stingers yet. So I, I've eaten bugs before, but no, it was straight up just like, imagine eating bubble wrap, but bubble wrap filled with like juicy, salty bug oh, guts. Yeah. <laughs> and that, I haven't Ooh, gagged the very often. Of sweetness left over or not even? No, zero apple. honey. No honey. And not even, not even, not even laced with honey. Just bee eggs and larval bees, basically. Um, but you smile, you take it on the chin and you uh, say delicious. Thank you very much. And you try everything once and some things just once because uh, once is enough, right? So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Too right. Too right. Um, yeah. The, the, exp um, the experience with had, had you i'm jumping around a little bit here because i uh, did you climb kilimanjaro like i i know obviously geographically roughly where they're located kind of north east tanzania kind of a little bit south of the border between you know the kenya and and like the mass so boring and serengeti almost um and did you climb kilimanjaro before before that Mm. So I arrived uh, shortly into 2021 in January. The first thing we did was climb Kilimanjaro. Um, and then from there, went and spent some time with the Maasai, did a, a hike, five-day trek along the Ngoro, Ngoro Highlands, which was honestly one of the most beautiful treks I've ever done in my entire life. It pissed rain the entire time. But even then, like it opened up the last day, and I've never done a, a trek. And I've done a ton of treks, man. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Walking along that ridge, like the Ngoro Goro Crater, where there's lions and giraffes. Like we didn't see anything like that, but we had to have a, a Maasai warrior guide who had a spear and also a park ranger with a, a rifle yeah. in case we encountered animals. Primarily buffalo cause problems. Lions are pretty scared of people these days, as you can imagine. But um, yeah, but we did see, like we saw zebras, we saw buffalo, we saw all kinds of animals in that trek. But the last day, as we're kind of cresting over the last piece, there's a, a mountain called Oldonio Lengai, which yeah, is the, yeah. the Maasai mountain of God. This incredible active volcano that just punctures out of the earth and it's always like laced with um, clouds on top and we had the opportunity to climb that and it was probably harder like well the final day of kilimanjaro was a hard day that day it's it's one day to climb this mountain this volcano was harder than that last kilimanjaro day it was just so steep and there was very little safety system it was just like sheer rock but we got to the top and there was this beautiful active volca uh, volcano crater it's a different kind of uh, volcano it's the only one like it in the world it has they call it cold lava which is like carbonite lava. And I think the glowing red lava you see is like silica, silica like glass-based lava. So it's like this brown, like a dark gray color, but it had made this giant cone in the middle. So it's like this giant uh, volcanic crater, then this giant cone coming up like a giant stalagmite or something with a smokestack in the top. And we were up there for for hours. Um, just, uh, I'd never seen anything like it. it, it it's incredible over there. Mm -hmm. What is the, what's the altitude of that? Is it, is it like, Something like three thousand meters, or yeah, I don't think it's over four, or it's yeah, very close. So it's to not. Four. It's not really yeah. in that kind of altitude sickness. So, did you get altitude sickness on Kilimanjaro? Because I, I did. <clears throat> yeah, I, I it kicked my ass actually. So I had the idea of, <laughs> so my, my 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 main form of travel. It, it's kind of unique to me. It's I always try to challenge myself in in new and different ways. So, and that's because way back in the day, I um. I learned through travel that if I do these things that I'm scared of that challenge me, I, I grow immensely. And so I, I was not at all like the guy I am now. I wasn't outgoing. I, I was terrified of public speaking, I had a phobia of public speaking. And I was able to grow into this job and this life by doing the things that I was most scared of. So that's kind of my travel style now. I wasn't scared to climb Kilimanjaro, but I did want to challenge myself a bit more. So I decided to take a watermelon up on my shoulder the entire time. And it might, it's a little, it's a silly, funny idea, but the idea is like in my head was, I don't know if I can do this. People are saying I can't do this. I know I'm physically fit. I know the mountain isn't that dangerous. Like I wouldn't do K2 or Everest with a freaking watermelon on my shoulder yeah but it would be an interesting element and also a different way to tell a story a different way to tell a story about hey guys if you challenge yourself and do the things you think you can't and do the things that other people think you can't then well, what's going to hold you back like if by proving to yourself and other people you can do these things that are impossible or different you, you teach yourself an amazing lesson about what you can and can't do 
And that was the the through line of the piece, laced with a little bit of comedy, because how serious can carrying a watermelon up a mountain <laughs> actually be? Um, but one thing I didn't realize is, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty fit guy. Like, I, I take this job very seriously. I'm out, I'm training five days a week to be able to make sure I don't put myself in danger, other people in danger when I do some of these, these bigger experiences. Uh, so I assumed I wouldn't get altitude sickness. I haven't done that many mountains in my life. I've got like 800 scuba dives and all kinds of stuff underwater but I've never actually done mountains very much. Jungles, yeah, underwater, yeah, all these different things, yeah. Deserts, yeah, but not mountains. So, uh, I mean, other than maybe the uh, the Laris Trek in Peru and some bits and pieces here and there. Um, so, I mean, Kilimanjaro is 5,800 meters. It's freaking high. And on day, we did a nine day trek, seven days up, two days down. The last two days, I was hurting, man. I didn't, it, and I guess altitude sickness doesn't care if you're young or, or old or fit or not fit. It just hits you, hits you how it hits you. Um, so for me, I I had to take Diamox uh, a couple days in a row, uh, and then they also in our group of there were six of us climbing. One guy um, had to be literally carried. Um, up one the of those, last what do they call them? The Kilimanjaro <laughs> stretch, the, the wheelbarrows. That yeah, yeah, and one of the one of the girls uh, couldn't make it. Um, the altitude sickness kicked her ass. So I'm lucky I did make it. Um, I caught it early with the Diamox, this pill you can take to increase, increase your blood O2 levels. But yeah, it, um, it, made me, it humbled me because I didn't feel like I had control. I didn't feel like I could control that element. And I didn't really understand it either. So Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting, interesting one. I mean, one of my past jobs, I organized, um, like, it was almost like mass trips to Kilimanjaro. I, uh, you know, hate to say it, but um, we would do like, uh, organize probably about 40, 40 trips a year um, to Kilimanjaro. And ironically enough, it was always, the, not always, but a, a major part was, was the fittest guys, guys like you, um, who really struggled with, with with altitude. I think the science behind it is like just related to their normal oxygen like usage intake, and then th that you know the fitter you are, actually you, you get affected because you're used to the, the amount of oxygen that you're used to getting when you're training and, and doing that exercise. But I don't remember. I used to I used to know more about that. And mm -hmm. and dimoxia was was something that a lot of the, the doctors and medics went up recommended people um because i think i think it was more because it reduces the like the swelling it's it's like a diuretic so it reduces the liquid in your in your body reduces the swelling so reduces the headaches mm -hmm. um and then i guess the kilomet the, the the watermelon thing we, i mean did you have porters you would have had porters helping with 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 some of your kit and stuff yeah um well I've, like they would carry the tents and everything the um so yeah so you, you know those guys um, the amount of kit they carry up is oh, dude. incredible, isn't it? Machines. It makes it, it makes my little my little uh, you know adventure seem trivial. Like uh, I'm pretty sure those guys had watermelons in their backpacks they were carrying anyway, and yeah. uh, and um, that's it. Like you don't. And also, I got a lot of criticism by people saying, "Oh, you had porters, yeah, yeah, cheater, yeah, 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 making these poor people carry your stuff, dude." Like. <clears throat> People don't understand how the world works sometimes, especially yeah. you make you make content and people start throwing stones at you that they think they know everything about the world. And it's just it's it's hard to know what to do, because, for example, dude, we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's hundreds, maybe even thousands of guys that, that their job was to, to, to get paid to carry things up Kilimanjaro. And there's rules in place where like the porters are treated fairly. They can only carry a certain amount of weight. And like these people have been unemployed now for a year. You know, and so I, yeah, of course I use porters. I, I'll, I'll use triple the porters because I want to give, I want to help these people. They're amazing people. They work hard, and when people don't have these opportunities to work, they start turning to other devices. You know, they, they, it, you see it all the world. Yeah, it's a message that resonates with me so much, and and it's something that I wanted to talk to you about because uh, you know we've known each other for a while, and and I've always seen it from your like in the messaging that you put out how how important travel is, just to just build yourself as a person, to build, you know, the experiences you get from traveling, from meeting people around the world, from understanding different languages, cultures, how people live, religions, and that's all come to a halt. And the, and it's so easy for, you, you know, the West, so some of the Western world that have now, you know, so quickly to, to throw those first stones against people traveling when they have the, 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 the 
you know, we have the privilege of governments who are, you know, supporting people by, uh, you know, paying their wages essentially to stay at home and do nothing, and mm-hmm. and and to stop the travel industry. Exactly what what, what you said was. You know, you're taking millions and millions of jobs, you know, working man's jobs. No, we're not talking about, you know, fancy hotels here. Of course, they're on the list, but working ma- working jobs, the waiters, the, the barmen, the, uh, the porters, the, like millions and millions of people that do not have that government support. And, and that's something that, that is, is just not talked about enough. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, more with you on that. Well, dude, we have these big, beautiful castles we, we, we've we paid for with Netflix on our on our computers and telephones. And we can go like we the quarantine and lockdown isn't so bad when you have a, a house to live in and you have some income or maybe some savings or your government's helping. There, there's there's just hundreds of millions of people around the world who are, are starving and can't feed their family. I get like I guess I bit, get a bit emotional about it because very soon into the pandemic, um, I realized this in a very ab- abrupt and, and powerful way. Uh, so doing this job, especially making content, often I work with um, private guides or like people who are a little bit more like savvy. You know, they 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 have a private guiding company or I, I build these relationships with these pretty interesting people around the world. Um, so there's the first message out of many messages I got from from my friends around the world. <clears throat> was a guy in Southeast Asia who, um, when I first went to visit him, was like a decade ago, and he was working for um, an employer. And I was like, "Dude, you should like have your own business, you know, set everything up." And so he quit and he started his own business as a guiding. His brother set up a, a bed and breakfast, and they have this little thing now, and they were making money. And they, like, he deserved this success because he was an amazing guy who'd worked really hard to learn English and everything. So I get a message, um, oh, maybe a month in last year, and saying like. I'm, I wasn't ready for this. Um, I can't feed my family. My my wife is pregnant. I have to take a construction job at night. We have to work in the rain and the mud, and I can barely make enough money just to support my family. Can you help me? And I was like, oh, man, I'm here in Canada, you know, complaining how bad it is again, watching Netflix or Tiger King or whatever the, the, the hell we were doing at the time. Yeah. And I sent, I sent him some money because like he was a good friend of mine and I'd met him a couple of times in the past in, in Southeast Asia and we'd done awesome trips together and made content. And then months went by and I got another message uh, and it's just like, Mike, living is worse than... Uh, living is worse than dying right now. There's nothing we can do to, to save. The, the government's doing all these crazy things um, and I don't know what to do anymore. And like, it just breaks my heart because like, I, I, am I, I can I keep on sending him money? I guess I, I could, I could try to help, but he's like, I, I want to start a YouTube channel to make money like you, but like, you can't just start a, <laughs> this doesn't yeah. really work that way. It's not a magical key. Um, and like, he's, he's one of a, a few of these friends, these cool people that I met around the world that were like hustling, like business, like had done really, really good work um, in the tourism ministry to, to make their businesses grow. And, and, uh, and what, what did they do wrong? They did nothing wrong. The world just decided to change. Not, not over the course of a few months, like abruptly, you didn't really have an opportunity to, to do anything else. You know, if you could have seen the tourism ministry slowly dwindling down over, over a year, maybe you could, if you're fast on your feet, make some changes in your life but no there's hundreds of millions of people out there that went from you know working and having families to just completely unemployed with with no other options really you know so it's hard to talk about and people don't realize this either that uh we've had it pretty good uh compared to a lot of the people on the planet most yeah i mean i i've got exactly the same story i mean we you know we run trips in sri lanka in india in philippines in the amazon letitia which we're going to talk about in a little bit and all of all of those like every single one of those places at the beginning i was you know and bearing in mind i run a business that has been hit the hardest you know we've had zero business from uh essentially from march last year run zero trips so tiny bits of revenue from people who are trusting you that you're going to survive and and carry on when when this you know when this goes on which is amazing to those people but but nothing and uh and at the beginning it was you know i was helping with what we what we could to our crew in the philippines to uh to eliseo in the amazon um people who who exactly what you just said in 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 that in that story was they went from we're planning to have trips and now we've, we forcibly cannot. 
Um, and yeah, at the end, they understood the position I was in because like, like you said, I could, we just couldn't afford, I couldn't afford to send money because I'm in the same boat and they totally mm -hmm. understood that. So there was a connection, you know, full on connection there, but it, it just doesn't work. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it really is. It, it's, it, I just hope that, that, you know, vaccinations seem to be picking up now, um, that, that will, that will ignite the, the kind of a the, the next phase of of travel and people getting back on planes and going to these destinations and and, mm -hmm. and seeing and then and then that that money will come back to to those pe to those people so yeah. yeah i mean that's kind of led into a little bit into the amazon itself i know it's um i, I guess a little bit of a backstory is how i first met you initially was was randomly at a travel conference and you heard about the Amazon challenge that we were running. It was our first ever Amazon challenge. And mm. I guess even more of a backstory, we used to run um, with, with Juan, um, our co-founder, we used to run a small company in Colombia. And one of our favorite parts that w was a trip that we created in the Amazon. So it was like an immersive Amazon trip, more like a tour where we had put together this itinerary. It was mainly Juan and, and um, Eliseo, who you met, who's a local indigenous um, from the Tacuna tribe in Leticia. Um, first of all, not a lot of people realize that Colombia has a large part of their country in the Amazon. You know, most people are associated with like Ecuador, Brazil, Peru. Um, and I'm, I, so I met you in Berlin at a travel conference. And I guess it, it goes to show the, the nature of your kind of in, like, um, how instantaneous you kind of make decisions because i remember saying right we've got this trip running would you be interested and then i think half an hour later you said yeah i'm in uh, <laughs> the next time i spoke to you uh juan was actually running the trip but you were like you know it was a couple of weeks later and you were in the amazon um what was was that your first time in the in the amazon Mm. Uh, not the first time I had been my first time in Colombia. Um, I had been to the Peruvian Amazon a little bit in the past, but not yeah. not like I'd never been that deep before. Um, I what's that? I think Iquitos or whatever it's called in Peru. That's like the the standard jungle experience. I had never spent because we we were we were in the middle of nowhere, man, <laughs> and that was really cool. Uh, so I, I, I let's say no, not like that. It was my first time in in like the Amazon, you know, the fantasy. What was your like i know it's a while back now but if you were to try and re like what were the, what are the memories that kind of stand out from that trip if if any i mean i know you had a two kind of two sides to that trip you did the amazon challenge with us um we had teams i think they were from like a bit over europe and holland and, and a few of my friends um and and then you did another experience what was your like standout memories or now when you think about it what we what are the things that stand out mm. yeah yeah i had never done anything like that before i mean i've done some interesting adventures but because the format was kind of like you know the amazing race or like you know this, this i'd never done i never done anything like that with with the race element and the challenge element like uh, so for me it was it was really it was really fun um so the guy i went with a guy named caspar we had a few years earlier or about a year, yeah a couple years earlier had just finished this like two year project with the german national tourism board filming these incredible stories of reunification to celebrate the 25th anniversary of reunification in germany and so uh caspar and i are very different caspar is a dutch guy who like who who's grew who spent years in italy he, i would say he's very italian in, in his passion and um volatility sometimes <laughs> <laughs> i see where this is going <laughs> whereas I, I i consider myself like uh pretty stoic um and, and he's a bit more fiery i guess and both have pros and cons uh i thought it would be a very interesting experience for us to do it together because uh we we've worked together um we've worked together quite a bit actually i have a timer on my phone one sec let me get that
and I'm back, and this is live. So let me explain that. So I, I put uh, these three keywords to remind myself every day at a certain time, which are playful, discipline, and bold. Three things I want to be more of. Um, and so the alarm is supposed to convince me to be those things at precisely 2.30 every single day. Um, but what it's <laughs> done is mostly interrupt important phone calls, <laughs> no, uh, which you just no did right there, there. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, so I thought we'd be a good team because – we, 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 we had some intimate, exciting um, conflicts of interest during the two-year project, and I thought it would be really kind of a fun, a different act, different experience, like a like a, like a celebration for finishing this awesome product together, but also I think it'd be a cocktail for interesting videos, <laughs> because I knew that we 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 got along really well, but we had different opinions sometimes that uh, caused a little bit of fireworks, and that's exactly what it what it delivered actually. So my my memories that I remember most most uh, vividly are one time where he we were like two days deep in the Amazon and a lot of it was paddling in these dugout canoes that were leaky and rocky and so but to keep everyone safe you would give in like walkie talkies and G walkie talkies yeah or GPS yeah, yeah. or these these devices to make sure we don't get lost in the middle of this vast yeah rainforest. I think it was a spot device yeah. Yeah, spot device, that's what it was. And so we were rushing, 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 and dugout canoes are not made for 185-pound, six-foot dudes, which you both are. And so, and he, I guess he had hip problems, so he is like, his hips were hurting, and he was rocking the boat back and forth the entire time. He had to, like, lay down and paddle because his hips were hurting too much to sit up and paddle. And I just thought it was hilarious, and he just kept on swearing and, like, rocking the boat and uh, we needed something like uh, he needed to charge his phone or something. I don't remember what it was. Um, no, what happened was we got too much water in the boat. And the water started to get inside of our dry bag because he didn't close the dry bag okay. with all the stuff in it. And so he goes to pour the water out of the dry bag and didn't like – but every, it, everything's in the dry bag. And so I just watched him dump like the spot GPS, like the phone charger <laughs> – the, all the food we had for the day, our spare water bottle, just watch him dump all that into the bottom of the Amazon River. And I was like, what? And he's and he's like, like he didn't realize he did it either. <laughs> but I think we were just running on so little sleep. And there was the the element to push and like race and beat the other guys. And we're both really competitive. And he just dumped all everything to keep us alive into the bottom of the of the river. And unfortunately, so I didn't yeah. get it on camera because you can't roll everything all the time. Yeah. And so we, anyway, and so we had been, when the, the camera's out, it's really hard to actually race. Like, you know, you can't film and actually paddle at the same time. So I put the camera away for a sec. So we had actually focus on, anyway, I watched him dump all of that, which was just so funny. And then the little fight we had after uh, was, was really funny too. <clears throat> but it was cool, like to be able to go so deep in the, uh, in this, in the rainforest and do some of these challenges like spear throwing and, um like uh what blow else darts, we just, yeah blow darts as well uh, and also meet some of these characters that had never really encountered people like us before and, and also we were all the whole crew was really adventurous so us being able to like participate and joke around and uh, it, it was it was really cool and also what another vivid thing i remember is the blue dye i forget the name of it exactly but this yeah. crushed seed that they that uh, the locals would use to dye themselves and so you'd meet these little kids that were like blue smurfs in the middle of nowhere because they uh, at a certain point in their life they they dye themselves blue or, or some yeah it was really really cool i really felt like we were we were um you know out there like living the true amazon experience and that that's, yeah I mean, whenever i try and t try and explain to someone a little bit about the amazon like uh, the first thing i normally say is this there's nothing else that nothing no other jungle that that can like that I've ever seen that can compare to it. Like I've been in, you know, we don't really, like we have got rainforests in, in, in Kenya. You've got kind of jungle in, 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 in Thailand. Obviously I haven't been to like Central African Republic and the Congo and places, but um, I, I would imagine it might be similar, but the Amazon is, is just amazing. The, like the, the diversity of the plants, you know, like having grown up on the equator and then and then living you know in, in the northern hemisphere you you get used to this kind of trees and plants and bushes and flowers and things that they are but nothing can prepare you for what you actually see in the amazon when you get there you know the yeah. size of the palm trees the the fact that every single tree has these thorns the size of like six inches on them um is yeah is amazing and it's it's something i always 
the jungle is just yeah the amazon in particular is is an amazing place and i'm hoping to speak to eliseo i'm not sure if you remember him he, he's from uh well you yeah you, you definitely do but we met him yeah i remember him yeah he um i'm planning to get him on the podcast to just talk about his his experience kind of growing up there and, and listen and and listen to you know his his background um how after the amazon trip you then went a step further didn't you um it was because the amazon trip was about i think it, our amazon challenge was eight eight days or seven days and then you went a step further and went like deep deep into the jungle what was what the hell was that all about and what was, what was that like <laughs> mm. about uh six months before that i had been or maybe a year i don't remember now but i was in the peruvian Amazon uh, and to find ayahuasca. And so ayahuasca is the hallucinogenic co cocktail of herbs and spices from, from the Amazon rainforest that's supposed to make you see God or, or whatever, the fabric of the universe, answer answer life's questions. And so I had done that a, a few months earlier and I was, I had really, um, that's a whole different story, but uh, I, I I enjoyed it. Um, it. It was it was powerful, uh, and I I was looking to learn more about these traditional hidden medicines of of, of the largest jungle what, in the what world. What is the ayahuasca actually like? What is that experience in particular? Is is it? What, 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 talk me through that because I've never done ayahuasca. I've always kind of wanted to, but never <laughs> had the opportunity. Um, what did talk me through that? Like the ayahuasca mm. kind of tradition. Yeah, it, it it's um it's a potent uh, hallucinogen with uh, I guess DMT is, is the active compound, and the ayahuasca is actually a root uh, a vine. Sorry, that um, then with if you combine that particular vine with other different plants, it releases this this DMT molecule that then you can drink in this fermented beverage that makes you violently ill but also at the same time uh, gives you potent um, hallucinations uh, but not like you don't see a rabbit come out of the ground and say hey follow me to never never land not really like that for me it was more like neo in the matrix where he sees the code of of um of what he's living in uh, but instead of code it was just spirals and geom like fractals and sacred geometry and all these things you you see photos of and pictures of and you're like oh uh, now i understand where it comes from or maybe it's my mind just painting that i don't exactly know but it felt like you got to see kind of like what everything was made out of and that's mm -hmm. a really cool thing everyone has their own beliefs there um but it was really cool to kind of what felt see what felt like the fabric of of how everything is made which is i mean like anything that that's i mean just seeing that is is quite a profound experience yeah um yeah so th it was really really good uh and i i knew when i was there in peru i learned that there was much more than just ayahuasca and that's just the most famous one you hear all about now and when i we did this experience it's probably like yeah five years ago um no one really knew what cambo was cambo is, is this um it's not hallucinogen but it, it it's this um frog venom you run they they burn holes in your skin burn a, a, a patch put the frog venom on you have another <laughs> severe reaction and uh, it's supposed to cleanse your body it, um boost your immune system make you see better smell better hear better all these kinds of things and now it's becoming a bit more popular like you can get it done in mexico and and probably california and places but at that time it, it was pretty much unheard of it's still pretty unheard of so i i had heard about that and i knew that it happened in the brazilian amazon not so much the peruvian amazon and i knew that we were close to brazil because leticia in the southern point of of colombia is like next it's, it's like the the river Long goes through all yeah you've got brazil over you've got brazil just to the right of a small tributary river that comes in the amazon <coughs> and the other side of the amazon river you've got peru and then you're in colombia it's yeah it's an amazing triangle and you visit actually it by default Leticia, they've got no border restrictions you can just cross over to peru and and, and brazil yeah yeah it's all all the jungle baby um so we we i wanted to find this stuff i wanted to find cambo i wanted to find an authentic cambo experience with a authentic shaman and after our our uh, jungle race but the question is whenever you're trying to find these authentic experiences it's like what do you do do you google authentic combo experience amazon <laughs> like you know because you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get that at all right if it's got a facebook page or a, or a yelp review it's not 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 authentic 
So then how do you find these things? I mean, word of mouth, I guess, but we didn't really know that many people there or like, I mean, very few people just wander off into the Amazon to have frog poison rubbed in their skin. <clears throat> so we were trying to find leads. Uh, we had about a, a week and a half left uh, before we had to go. And so a couple of days after our, our recovering from the after party, I think of uh, getting back from the race, we were walking downtown to the main Leticia Square. And there's these beautiful birds that all swarm around there every evening. So we're yeah. watching that and trying to think of a plan. And there was a guy selling jewelry. And we look at them and uh, I'm, I like I like bracelets and things. And it's always I like, kind of like supporting people who do that kind of stuff, too. So went over to look at some of these bracelets he was, he was making. And I saw the iconic Cambo scar, like these just racing stripes of just dot, 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 dot on on both his arms. And I because I, I was been researching this, I knew that it was it had to be Cambo. Like, so like you, you, you recognize that and you thought, OK. Yeah, mm -hmm. but he looked a little bit sketch. <laughs> so, so uh, we like started asking bracelet questions and kind of like judged him, and then a little bit, and then asked about the scars, and then he started, started explaining combo, and then we're like, oh, you know, like, oh, where where, where is this place exactly? He goes, oh, this is man in the woods. It's like three days journey from here, two days journey from here. Um, he's he's very special, very powerful. He does the best one around, and so like starting to line up the dominoes here, and it's like, well you know like would we be able to go and he goes oh um i guess i could take you and so we were had to make it a choice at that point um are we going to trust this guy we don't know <clears throat> to take us two days in the amazon rainforest to meet someone else we don't know to get some crazy frog venom ritual done to us um and trust that we're going to be okay and he's not going to like rob us and drug us or uh, anything like that and so we had to make this weird judgment call um the next day because like, we'll meet the next day and talk about it and we asked him how much it's going to be. He said like a hundred US dollars each. And we're like, that sounds a little bit expensive for just going to the jungle. But I don't know. I don't know the price for this kind of stuff. Um, no, I just know that shamans normally don't charge money, right? They want offerings. And so he explained, yeah, the hundred dollars is to take like the boat and the taxi and the truck and then get food and get all the stuff. And it's not that cheap after all, you know. And it all checked out. And actually, I'm, the, the video I, I posted about this did an okay job explaining it. But you have to understand, like, we're two big guys, right? Like, we didn't do well in the canoe, but we can, we can, we, he's a small, he's a small guy. He's maybe like a foot shorter than us, quite, maybe like 50, 50 pounds. You fancy yourself in a, in a, in a physical confrontation. Right. And so I don't think he would mess with two big guys but again he could drug us and then take our wallets or something and so the next day we had a, a series of um of tests to see if 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 we could trust them so the first one is an old hitchhiking trick that i learned where if you take a you, you tell someone you're going to take a photo of them and send it to your mom or your girlfriend or something so we're like hey man do you want to take a photo together to say goodbye and you know just to show everyone we're going to be going soon and so we took a photo and he was cool with it. And we said explicitly, we're going to send it to our friends. So he wasn't weirded out. If someone has bad intentions, they're not going to like that at all, right? Because you just proved them. We had no connection, but he, he didn't know that. Uh, and then the next test was, we'll just pay him all the money now. And then say we have to go take care of a couple things and be back. And so we gave him the $200, 100 each, and said, hey, man, we, um, we forgot something back at the hotel. It's about like a 30-minute walk. So... In about, you know, in 30 minutes, we'll be back here, but we won't be back any sooner because it's really far. So just uh, make sure to meet us back here and, and we'll we'll continue. But he, we had already given them money. We didn't, we had everything we needed. We just wanted to give him 30 minutes to run away. <laughs> and so also, that's, with, with, yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome because <clears throat> you're, now it's not even about the money. It's just about the experience. <laughs> you don't even care about the money. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah, and so we... Um, we because originally we're like you know 50 percent first 50 percent after and he's like no i need all the money now because i've got to buy supplies like okay 60 now for and he's like no i need all the money now i need it all now and so we're like god damn it and so we let him we literally gave, gave him the 200 dollars. went around the corner had coffee and we're like he's gonna be there in 30 minutes i don't know man and we came back and he was there with a smile on his face and he was ready to go so we went and uh, it was tr yeah, true to that, like two days into the forest on like planes, trains and automobiles. Well, not, not planes, but you know what I mean? Like all kinds yeah. of, of uh, transportation. Yeah. And we ended up finding this little hill in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. And we walk up and again, I, I wanted to make a video, um, but I didn't know. I didn't know whether or not this guy was, would be OK with cameras. I asked our, our guide. He didn't know either. Again, we didn't know if he'd seen foreigners before. So I had the camera down um, 
but we meet this guy and this we go to the hut and then there's like the kids that run up next to us and they run in and get the shaman and this guy like hobbles out with one foot that's swollen up like an elephant leg with some like dripping bandages on it and he's he looks it looks very shamanish but he apparently got bit by a snake and so he had one foot that was like swollen and just like not doing very well uh but it was kind of a weird mo like scene to see this guy hobble out obviously you know trying to fight um, a, a poisonous snake bite with whatever he, he was trying to do yeah <clears throat> and so we go inside and we start to talk a little bit <clears throat> and uh the guy's like okay we can do combo for sure uh but we'll do it tomorrow and tonight we'll just relax and and enjoy some dinner with uh, with the family which was great. So we set up hammocks inside their inside their big long hut, and we you know hang with the kids, and I slowly like get my GoPro out and start filming a little bit, and but really trying to immerse myself in into the situation, and I'm not trying to make a video yet. I'm just trying to make you know let people know that I'm I'm here to experience. You come it in peace. You want to learn. You want to discover. <laughs> your yeah. You you're in discovery mode for sure. And I think one of the worst things you can do as tourists is show up somewhere and like sanitize your hands. I mean, maybe it's a bit different in this this world now, but you know, stand back and you know, be afraid to get dirty with all your clean clothes and only eat your prepackaged granola bars. Like you're just you're you're basically setting yourself up like we are different people and we're not going to get along. Constantly. Right? Couldn't agree more. You got You got to go in there. You got to eat the worm. You got to roll around in the dirt, and then you can have amazing, amazing immersive travel experiences. So I was just worried about that. Just like you know trying to fit in as best as I can and showing that my acceptance of, of how interesting this was and how interested I, I really was in all of it. And so that was great. And then after a while we had some rice and beans and it was great. And then some of the other village elders came and <clears throat> sat around the fire inside this little like yurt hut longhouse thing. And they bring this little pipe thing and they start pour putting some gray powder in their hands. And the other guy brings this big long white thing out and didn't know what this was. And then so we see them put this gray powder in this little long white thing, like a, almost like a pipe. But he goes to like smoke it, but then he doesn't smoke it. He leans over to one of the other village elders and he blows like a blowpipe the powder that was in the other end into his friend's nose. Yeah, and was friend, that rapé? Was that what it was called? Was that rapé? Rapé. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, rapé. And so I was like, what the hell is this stuff? And so our guy's like, oh, it's, it's called rapé. And I, I had no idea. I'd never heard it before. I didn't know what it was. <clears throat> didn't know anything. Turns out the white thing is an eagle bone, and birds have hollow bones, uh, so they're lighter so they can fly. That was the pipe. Mm, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the powder, I still don't know what the powder was. Probably a bit of tobacco, probably a little bit of coca, probably a little bit of other just things from the jungle. Yeah, and, I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of everything. And so when the a village elder takes this hit to the nose, he kind of goes... No big deal. And then so he always to do both nostrils. And so boom, in the other nostril. And then, mm, good. And then they offer it to us. And so Kaspar and I, my Dutch friend, are like, oh my God, who, who's gonna go next? And you kind of have to. You don't you don't have to have to. But again, going by this 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 these rules I live by, which is like try everything and immerse yourself. Obviously, it's not gonna kill them, right? Like Yes, you get see you snuff the the rapé, and so Caspar and like rock paper scissors, rock paper. And so I win, he loses, he goes first. So I I have my camera out at this point, <clears throat> and so Caspar indicates that he's ready, and the the shaman fills his little pipe thing and puts it in Caspar's nose, and blows. And I have never heard a human being make the noises Caspar did after that powder hit his poor nostril. He. <laughs> immediately stood up and just liquid fell out of every hole in his face just like tears snot spit every just liquid just exploded and he couldn't breathe he was <gasps> like he, he couldn't take a breath and so i i was like filming like oh this is gonna be so funny and then i was like oh, 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 oh. like i was completely speechless because I, I didn't know it at all if he was okay <laughs> he went from like oh boy here it goes to like choking on his own tongue Two, like, two, two, uh, two foreigners just lost in the middle of the jungle with like yeah. a shot to the nostril. Yeah. Mm. And his eyes open like two giant pool cue balls, just like, just completely. I'd never seen anybody be in that state of, of mind before. Uh, and so I, I was choking in my tongue, just trying to, uh, to, to ask him if he was okay. And he just like, he's not still not breathing. He's still kind of choking, like trying to walk circles around the inside of the hut. And, and finally I'm like, are, 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 are you okay? And he's like, uh, and <clears throat> at that point, the shaman 
beckons him back because you can't just do one. You have to do both nostrils. Oh, so. <laughs> so just back there, and then boom. And then Did he not at that point just say like yeah but they 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 would not allow like he's like no no thank you but he's like they're like come on yo like this is how you have to do too you can't you can't unbalance like this is how it works you have to do there's no other option so he sits down and does the whole song and dance again um and then and it's my turn right and so at, at that point he's like he's sitting down his eyes are still wide <laughs> open like dinner plates and he's but he can talk now and he's like whoa whoa <laughs> and so i go and i sit down <clears throat> and again, like, you know, they load up the pipe and they blow it into your nose. And I just remember seeing white, just boom, like ex explosion. Yeah. And um, then I, I'm standing up and I like, it's a like, super intense, burning, burning, burning feeling. And you just feel like this rush of just vibration through your entire body. And then, um, yeah, I mean, you, you can't breathe because your nose is filled with like basically cinnamon powder or whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> <laughs> we all know how that goes based on the videos yeah. and then yeah. you sit back down you do it again and and then you feel like you're you feel like you're full of electricity which would probably i mean if you've ever like snuffed uh tobacco or the white stuff or chewed tobacco or whatever or like smoked a cigarette you know that like vibration um it, it was it was like that but you know a lot a lot more but fire in your nose <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah and I, then, I remember uh, go ahead that that just how you explain you know the cinnamon th feeling like they, they they also you probably also had um mumbai is it mumbai or or the 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 the, the green like really fine powder oh yeah 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 uh -huh. i forgot they, about that we did that they, yeah. they kind of it's kind of like cut like if you remember you probably in yemen they you know obviously lots of cut, the cut it's yeah. like this i think it's from what i remember like crushed out i'll probably be corrected by this air soon enough but like um tobacco maybe tobacco and maybe coca leaves as well and and that, but it's really really fine so just the process of getting it into your mouth is like is a huge challenge to not like choke and then uh you know you know spit it out so yeah, yeah exactly yeah, I, it, your, it resonates with me your story yeah sure. Uh, and then they passed out ayahuasca. And so we were sipping ayahuasca and then doing rap rapé back and forth. Uh, but the ayahuasca wasn't wasn't um, like the strong stuff that makes you hallucinate like I had done before. It was just like, a, I guess, a diluted mixture. And they were saying that each one of these substances puts you in touch with different kinds of spirits, high frequency spirits, lower frequency spirits. And I was like, oh, good and evil. They're like, no, just different, just different spirits. And so they were kind of balancing back and forth. And then was these this men, part of the journey towards like it, almost like the spiritual journey or even traditional journey towards the the actual frog poison ceremony or was it just because you were there and they were welcoming you and you know another, another night with the boys another night with the boys yeah okay mm -hmm. and so after we all um had taken our uppers and downers i guess uh we they they began to chant and they chanted for an hour until Caspar, Caspar and I were just kind of like, you know, spitting our thumbs like, and it was, it was really cool. But like at a certain point, like, I don't know the words. Um, and they've been doing it for an hour with their eyes closed. And so we're like, I guess we go to bed. It was like midnight or something. And so we just mm. curled up in our hammocks and went to sleep. It was actually really beautiful. Then at uh, 630, I get my toe pulled by our guide. Uh, and I was awakened with Mike Campbell. <laughs> it's like now. And he goes, yes, now five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. I, I, had, I had not like in my mind, I was like, I'm going to make like a little disaster pack. Like if things don't go well, I know where like my phone is. There wasn't reception, but like I, I know where everything is, like back camera batteries, like uh, Advil's, whatever I had to, to try to like make sure everything's going to be OK if I lose my state of mind or something. Yeah. So I had five minutes to get everything. And I was like, what about breakfast? He goes after breakfast. We have to do Campbell now. And so, yeah, I get everything together and they, there's all these little boys who are already having it done on their stomachs uh, because it, again, makes you throw up and cleanses parasites and different illnesses as well. So I was like jumped in the experience as the little boys were having their stomachs burned and the, the frog poison run uh, rubbed in. Once that happened, we had to run down the hill to the lake, probably like 100 meters or something. And I watched these boys go, boom, one at a time, boom, boom. Then our guide so went. Just to interrupt you there. In traditional, so in the traditional medicine form, these guys are having it because it's it's cleansing them like physically as well as mentally, or 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 both. Um, Is... From what I understood, it wasn't really mentally. Uh, so there was you were getting 
physically cleansed um, like your body was by, I guess, the vomiting and whatever else they they believe. Um, but You're also they're expelling like toxins from your body. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And boosting your immune system. But also there was mental benefits uh, like vision, hearing, sight, and uh, they they said they would do it also for that reason to be able to hunt or or fight better with with rival tribes. So they do this before hunting to be able to heighten their senses to be able to be more successful when they, when they hunted. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you'd freaking hunt it, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so then, yeah, um, the guy went, I watched Kaspar get two holes burned in his skin. The scabs picked off with a thumb, and then the frog venom rubbed, it, rubbed in. And then, So they just boom. take a, a stick, they they literally, like, put a, you know, heat it up, put a coal on it, and then stick it on your arm to, till, you're, till you burn, and then instantly, like, you, I guess you form a little bit of a... Uh, a blister and then that peel that off yeah basically with a little sizzle that is like a brand and that creates like a burn mark scar scab a little so bit that's of everything an entry point then to your kind of mm -hmm. yeah your skin and then I guess, yeah i guess they they sear the flesh uh yeah. which i mean it, it sound, sounds more painful than it actually was if it was metal i think it would have sucked more uh, but it's just a piece of wood, so I mean, metal can 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 transmit much more heat, much faster. But it's yeah. take a little pull, and just tss, tss, I mean, ouch, but not, yeah. not worse yeah. than a needle. Yeah, and then they would pick off the seared flesh. Oh, God, that sounds so bad. Um, it wasn't so bad, and then they just rub in this this frog venom. Um, yeah, it, and then so I saw I saw him go, and then I was last, and I was like, oh God damn it. So I rub it in. I had my little GoPro going, and I just sprinted to the water. And um, almost immediately, in like the first fifteen seconds, you just start to feel your head go boom, 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 and then you start to see black around the edges of your vision. And what they say is your body goes and has like a mild anaphylactic shock, um, not in your throat, but like in your face, like your limbs swell, everything swells. Luckily, not your throat, <clears throat> but your face especially. And you're supposed to throw up like violently after and feel like a very strong fever. And so as I was running, I, my head started to pound, headache, because like my face feel, felt very, very, very hot, um, black around the fringes of vision. I'm going down this hill, it's like slippery, there's like mosquitoes everywhere, I'm shirtless with like burn marks on my leg. I get close to the water, I see everyone just like naked and being bitten by mosquitoes, throwing up all there by the edge, the, edge, the edge of the water. I'm like, great, that's gonna be me in about two minutes. <clears throat> and so uh, you go, you go in the water. You're supposed to wash it off, and then you just wait, and it should be finished in five, ten minutes, they say. And so I uh, was rolling the GoPro. I wash it off. It's pounding, pounding, pounding. Headache, headache. I look over at Caspar, who at this point is vomiting like fluorescent yellow bile because he's just emptied himself. And uh, everyone else there is laying, like groaning, and then I say like, pounding, pounding, and I can feel like the you know the the little choke a little tickle a little like when you're about to throw up yeah and it's i look like over caspar yeah exactly and caspar's face is so swollen like it made him look like he was 90 just like big pronounced wrinkles everything was just like a big prune and i, I couldn't believe it it's like oh my god and he looked like he looked like hell it looked like hell and he's there just like groggy throwing up again like the color of like the color of this little notebook like we're talking stuff yeah that, like the, the turn the Ninja Turtles into, into superheroes kind of <laughs> color. <laughs> and um, so I'm sitting there and then I don't throw up and I start to feel better after about 10 minutes. But we get up and we're all covered in like big nasty welts from the mosquitoes. Everyone's faces are, 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 are swollen. Um, I guess um, my body didn't react, react to it as strongly as, as the others, but um, we were there. And the funny thing is like it gets subsides in five, 10, eh, let's say 10, 15 minutes. And then you feel really good. You don't feel high. You don't feel like you don't feel intoxicated. You just feel like grounded. the headache that dissipates. Yeah. Yeah. You just feel this like calm, calm energy. Just, just, boom. and you do notice things. Like it really did feel like you could hear things, smell things, see things better. But it was almost like the, the volume of the world was turned down. So you could kind of focus more on everything that was happening, the volume, but like, you know, you turn down the volume in the car when you get close to the address because you can just be, feel like you can be more aware. It was kind of like that. You just felt more, more aware. Yeah. Um, and I, I didn't have a 
a scientific chart with a, a double blind test to see if it actually was true, but it definitely felt true. It definitely felt like you were you were more aware for sure. Um, enough, I would do it again um, and bring like maybe a, a site chart and some other bits and pieces to be able to tra try to track a before and after a bit more accurately because it really did feel like it worked, but hard to tell. Yeah, well, I mean, listening to that story again from you, not not because I haven't heard the story. I've only seen that amazing video that you actually put <clears> together <throat> and it, hearing you, you, the first hand explanation of that has kind of brought it to life even more. And I mean, the explanation of like, I can't tell like people enough to go and watch that video because actually when I saw Casper, um, you know, you explaining how his, his face had swollen up, it was unbelievable. I couldn't mm. believe what I was seeing. And it was, it was, you know, it was terrifying and funny at the same time because you were like, are you okay? You know, his face just changed. And then obviously because you were in the water there, you know, and like most, bits of any water source in the Amazon there's like you know there's bits there's, there's little bugs that kind of bite you there's the mosquitoes and and then the welts like you were saying you know the welts that had built up on both of your skin was just like it just looked yeah I mean agonizing amazing all, all in one like what a what a crazy experience and then also yeah seeing the kids around just being part of the the normal life it was just like a, a normal day um was 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 amazing to watch yeah yeah um, and yeah funny 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 now but at the time like you don't know if if he's gonna be okay if you're gonna be okay like you're, you i mean you don't do it if you think you're not gonna be but you, you see your like a really good friend there with his face swollen up vomit like you 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 you're like oh my 100 percent. i mean i remember watching the video that you know i watched it a while probably just as you came back from the amazon when you, when you first made it and i remember literally feeling the tension of you know obviously knowing that you were right because you were both back but feeling that tension of like watching that happen was was, was yeah was was amazing yeah um, and yeah terrifying at the same time thanks man my biggest regret though is like because it was really hard to film at that point again you couldn't walk in there like i had all these interesting pieces to camera and this information i wanted to put in and i i didn't I didn't forget to film it because everything happened so fast. Again, like I didn't expect to have to wake up and do Campbell in five minutes. We had to leave very shortly after that because there was some issue with the transportation. Um, the night before, I didn't even know what Rappe was and there was no connection there to, to, to know. Um, and I, I guess I probably could have done it in voiceover later, but that was a bit earlier in my career where I did mostly, I didn't do much voiceover. I just I tried to explain things when I was there. And so the video lacked a little bit of depth because I didn't get to properly explain why we were doing this. It's kind of yeah. like some, you know, some crazy bros doing it. Um, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, now being able to tell the story here and, uh, and people, there's lots more information about it online too. But, uh, I mean, the, the adventure was, was, uh, a lot focused on the unpredictability of the entire experience. And also, I the, thought, yeah, I mean, I thought, I thought you captured it really well in the sense that that kind of ruggedness of it really almost made it even more for me anyway, like made it that particular video, like added to the, I guess a little bit to like the, the myth behind it, the, the, the spiritual journey that you guys were, were going on it for me, it added to that. So yeah, no, I thought it was, it was amazing. Um, speaking like career wise, you've obviously been traveling, for ages making video content and then i don't know how long ago it was but you 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 now work do you work for the bbc full time or is it something on the side that you just present a show or, or create content <laughs> what do you do uh, on your like bbc side travel show side the youtube channel came first so i've been doing that for a decade now and yeah. with that, um, every video you make on YouTube is like a fish hook in the ocean. The content doesn't doesn't go away like a lot of the other social platforms. So you make a video, it does well, and it stays around, and people can see it and contact you for various work opportunities. So I'm not really a full-time YouTuber. I do really like it. I make videos constantly, um, but I, I don't make my full income, uh, and my full attention isn't, isn't all on YouTube, okay. especially with some of these more crazy adventure travel things like um they're not for everybody <laughs> viewer discretion is advised for some of them and yeah some some do really well and some don't and some are challenging i mean like i said my travel style i try to challenge myself um and therefore a lot of viewers get challenged as well so um it's, it's a bit of a more niche audience but i really enjoy the audience i have built uh, a lot of really beautiful open-minded people we could talk about these these things together 
Um, and that's that's what I wanted. And with that, I've had some other cool opportunities. So I made a video about uh, a baby jumping festival in Spain, where it's, um, <clears throat> it's the only spot in the world where an uh, image of the devil is allowed into the church. And once the devil goes in the church, he's expelled uh, by the, the priest. And then he the, the, the newborns get put under on the road uh, on the way out of the church. And the devil jumps over the babies to cleanse them of natural sin. The same way we do baptism, just it's a bit of like a pagan Christian fusion. Yeah. Um, and it's super cool. And so I filmed that video uh, years ago and BBC saw it. They were looking for a new presenter on their show called The Travel Show, which um, uh, there's a few presenters on. And so we had a couple calls and uh, they hired me as one of the presenters on the show. So we've been working together now for about three years or so. And during normal times, it was like once a month we do about a week together. Uh, so that was, it wasn't full time. I was, I was just part time. And uh, that anyway, that um, that's a really good relationship. I'm kind of like their adventure guy. We've done some yeah. really cool stuff like scuba dive airplanes and climbed sequoia trees, redwood trees, sorry, in, um, in California and, you know, s sand bordered down singing sand dunes in Kazakhstan. It's been a, a really awesome opportunity for me. Um, and now, so uh, I'm also host of, of a podcast as well with, with Wondery Network. And yeah. it's called Against the Odds. So I'm actually co-hosting as well with a girl named Cassie, Cassie Dipical. And it's uh, uh, stories of mm, incredible, uh, they're incredible human survival stories. So the first one I, I did, it's it's live now, is the Thailand Cave Rescue. When people from all over the world came together to rescue those 12 boys. Yeah, amazing, toys. amazing story. Yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. And so uh, now I'm actually recording again tonight the the third season for that, which is going to be about Senator John McCain and uh, being trapped in a POW camp in Vietnam for five years. So these really interesting stories, and I, I love telling these because, like, I, my life is about challenges, and telling these people who have overcome these incredible challenges, much greater than mine, is really really inspiring. So between the YouTube channel and the part time gig with um, the BBC, other television stuff that's kind of more come and go and also the podcast uh that i'm a co-host with it's a pretty full schedule yeah and uh and you've you've i'm privileged enough to have to have managed to convince you to find time to come on ours so that's i really appreciate <laughs> that uh mike um I, I i just like telling the stories man and i like hanging out with like-minded people so and we, <laughs> we hadn't spoken in a while as well right so it was cool to catch up and also um i, I for me i just like i think how how i like I told you, I wasn't, I was the opposite of a natural for speaking my entire life. Um, I was terrified of it. And now it's my job. Like again, YouTube, TV and podcasting. It's crazy. Uh, and I, I attribute it to saying yes to a lot of little things like this. Little things are big things, just opportunities to talk and practice on things, practice things that you need to work on. Uh, and for me, it's like any opportunity I can come on, tell stories, um, share my message about fear or travel I, I like that because for me it inspires me as well like i get to inspire people hopefully with what i say and also it's just good to talk about the things you love because it makes you f the love bigger in you for these things too so i always love it yeah brilliant that yeah i couldn't i couldn't said it better myself like really inspiration to watch and yeah the content you put out uh, yeah i mean i'm sure everybody watching this or listening to this will go and will go and find it um, but it is amazing from my point of view. And obviously not just saying that, genuinely seen lot, lots of your stuff and it's been amazing. Um, brilliant, man. Uh, Mike, I don't want to take too much of your time. It sounds like you've got another few podcasts to do, but, um, <laughs> well, actually just a quick question on that note. So are you actually interviewing like the, the guy who orchestrated that cave rescue, for example? Rick Stanton, we did interview him, yeah. Wow, okay. And then you've made, was that a one podcast show or was it like to interview him or, or was it a series <clears throat> so it's actually it's scripted so it's four episode of, of four episodes for the thai cave rescue at least that was season one so four episodes of scripted podcast so uh, the story so, yeah telling Amazing. the story from, from oh, beginning okay. to end awesome. and the, the writers are incredible for it and the sound designer is incredible the producers everyone has been so awesome with I, I show up and i just lend my voice um but everyone else has done such a great job of crafting the story into really something that's like an, an audio experience like it, it's not a podcast it's like it's like listening to a, a movie or something but focused on, on obviously the hearing part of it and so how it normally works is we do four episodes of to tell the story and then the fifth episode is interviewing somebody who is 
part of the story. We were lucky to get Rick Stanton, like the dude who rescued the boys. There was more than just him, but he was like the lead guy, which is, yeah. it was so, I got to talk to him. It was so cool. Like it was really, really cool. And so Cassie uh, just finished hers and um, I'll be doing Senator John McCain. Unfortunately, John McCain passed away a couple years ago. So um, that won't be possible, but we'll find someone else who's central to that story. Mm -hmm. Wow, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll make sure to put all of those in these notes as, as well as like where people can find your info, your stories, your video, your content. But uh, just before you go, the main channel is, is your YouTube channel. It's the Fearless and Far, right? Is, is it Fearless and Far YouTube channel? Yeah, Fearless and Far, Far on YouTube, totally. And there's a new video there like every week or two. Um, I, yeah, so like right now I'm editing... Uh, the next one, which is the living with the Himba tribe for, for 24 hours in, in Namibia, which was a crazy experience. They take smoke baths. They uh, cover themselves in red ochre clay. And um, yeah, it was really cool. So that'll be live shortly. Wow. I look forward to it. Awesome, Mike. Well, it's so nice to chat to you. Went obviously a little bit over the time, but I mean, every minute, well, well spent so 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 nice to speak to you again and hopefully we can persuade you to, in your schedule to come on one of our other trips i know you've got a love for for tuk-tuks as well so we'll <laughs> see if, if pakistan is 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 on there and we can get you out to to drive a tuk-tuk around the, the himalayas yeah i think i have love for them because i haven't had to been stuck in one that keeps breaking down <laughs> yet, yet but we'll put it on the list <laughs> cannot guarantee that that won't happen <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. It was it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Cheers, Mike.